So we understand um, humanization, right? Well, equally, unfortunately, we have the attempt to dehumanize, right? So just like we're having a humanization as a process, there is dehumanization as a process, right? And the attempt of dehumanization is the oscillation from a recognition of one's humanity to the dehumanization of one's humanity. So if I go from, um, what was I saying? Uh, humanization. Oh, if I go from um, humanity to dehumanization, this oscillation from here to here is the act of dehumanization, right? This oscillation from a recognition of one's humanity to this loss, which needs to be recovered, is the process of dehumanization, right? Um, and by profession, I'm a, I'm a genocide theorist, right? and what I do is I analyze um, sort of the theory. My, I'm, a, I'm a theoretician, so I analyze I analyze genocide with respect to conceptual analysis, theoretical analysis, not not necessarily case by case case study analysis. Though that is extremely viable, that's not what I do. In an attempt for me to understand and better articulate and have a, an understanding of, of, of genocide, I don't think I can personally do a good analysis without understanding Fourier's conception of dehumanization. Because the whole point of um, um, subordinating, oppressing a group for the purpose of genocide, for the purpose of extermination, is to go through the process of dehumanization. And a good friend of mine and colleague, um, Dr. Gregory Stanton, incorporates dehumanization in his eight stages of genocide, right? So it is recognized the role that dehumanization plays in, gen in sort of genocide studies, genocide theory proper. However, it's also important to understand that this is inherently a social function, right? Genocide has particular sociological functions and also implications, right? The dehumanization of a targeted group, of a select group which has been deemed to be oppressed, has sociological implications, and we'll talk about those implications as well, right? All of which translates to the overarching pedagogy, the, the, the system in which education and knowledge is transmitted, and I'm an epistemologist, right? I, that's what I do. Um, I'm interested in how people come to learn and the different media in which me, people learn, which is why I'm doing my videos and these lectures for free virtually, right? Because it's an attempt to sort of reconstruct this pedagogical traditional approach. Um, so it's important to recognize the role of dehumanization. That process of dehumanization is buttressed on injustice, right? Right? Injustice, and then uh, it's, it's, it's adipose, right? It's, it's, it's the attempt to um, have an imbalance, and a recognized imbalance, right? It is a lack of fairness, right? It is unfair. There's something in the system which is inherently unfair. And that unfairness, right, that injustice, is what serves to further oppress the groups, right? Because it is at a point, maybe not at this point, but it will be a recognition at one of one's oppression. Initially, as we'll see later uh, in a few minutes, uh, there isn't a recognition of oppression at this point, but later there will be that recognition. Obviously, exploitation, right? And I'm not going to go into too much detail about all these. Some of these are self-explanatory. Exploitation. Number three is oppression. Number four is violence. I want to stop on violence for a little bit and just discuss violence. Um, violence for Fourier is the conduit with which the oppressor maintains power. It is through violence, right? And violence specifically targeted towards the oppressed group that power is maintained by the oppressor, right? So that there's always this relationship of violence. It's not as simple as it seems, however, right? What we'll see later is that the relationship and the way that violence unfolds as directed towards the oppressed group doesn't necessarily have to manifest as brutally as genocide, right? It, very, it almost never manifests that violently. What I study is, is, is an extreme sort of, is it an extreme relationship between an oppressor and an oppressed group, right? But you can imagine that there, there are sentiments of violence in a very cordial relationship which can keep people at bay, which can keep people in check, which can reinforce the authority that um, a privileged or an oppressor group has over those who have been 
subjugated or oppressed and so on, right? So that violence will see sort of the very the various forms that violence will play in Freire's at his best when he's talking about the use of violence in maintaining this sort of imbalance, this injustice in, in, uh, in power. Um, obviously, the dehumanization of lost humanity. And then lastly, um, dehumanization uh, is characterized by, sorry, by those who have been robbed um, of their humanity, right? They've been robbed of their humanity, so it's the loss of the humanity of the oppressed group, and this is important, right? This is, this is sort of tricky what he says. Um, um, those robbed of their humanity. So the question is, who are those who have been robbed of their humanity, right? Those robbed of their humanity are the oppressed group, right? That is an act of dehumanization. However, and it's very important to recognize this, and a, a lot of sort of contemporary theorists who discuss Freire, for whatever reasons, they miss this point. It's not only those who have been robbed of their humanity. Freire says himself, um, and this is, I'm, I'm sort of putting this in my own words, those who have robbed others of their humanity. Those who have robbed, those who have taken humanity, removed humanity from others, meaning obviously the oppressed group, is also dehumanized, right? So the loss of humanity or those who have taken humanity, right? So this is a dehumanization of both the oppressed and the oppressor, right? Um, so it's important to recognize that when we're talking about dehumanization proper, we're not specifically only talking, and I think I can find it because I, my notes are pretty methodical, but um, let me see if I can read it uh, just really quickly so you can see it. Um, on, um, location it is. Okay, here is what he says. He says, dehumanization, which marks not only those whose humanity have been stolen, dehumanization, which marks not only those whose humanity have been stolen, the oppressed group, but also, though in a different way, those who have stolen it, right? So when we're talking about dehumanization proper, uh, according to Ferrer, we're not only talking about dehumanization of the oppressed group, but also dehumanization of the oppressor, insofar as the oppressor has robbed another of that other's humanity. Very, very complicated. It's not necessarily easy to understand initially, um, as we go along, this is, I mean, this is the first few pages of Freire, we'll flesh out the meaning and the significance of that loss of humanity. Um, but properly speaking, when you're speaking to someone, or when you're writing about Freire, it's important that you uh, always qualify your use of the term dehumanization. By dehumanization proper, you should both mean the loss of humanity of the oppressed group, but also the taking of the oppressed group's humanity by the oppressor, because that's what uh, Freire himself specifically means when he uses the term dehumanization. Okay, I'm running out of space, so let me erase some stuff. All right, next thing uh, is to, and as I said, um, th this document, along with the lecture, is a living document, just as Freire's book I consider a living document. So as we progress, as I progress, um, through the chapters and through the various paragraphs and through the book in its entirety, what um, will happen is that the concept of dehumanization will, will grow. It will become more complicated, right? The concept of humanization will grow. It will be more complicated. Up until this point, this is how he's defined both of these concepts. Essential to the discussion between humanization and dehumanization is also the idea of struggle. The struggle. And the struggle, according to Freer, is a very technical term, right? It doesn't seem like struggle would be a technical term, but it's very technical uh, in Freer's pedagogy of the, the oppressed. So let's see what he means by struggle. All right. 